Once upon a time in a land not so far away, a college senior wrote an open letter to their institution. In it, they scorched the college for their treatment of students of color and the lack of resources and support available to them. The student even attached their capstone project, which detailed the financial turmoil that the institution would face if it didn't change its ways. That student was me. I was frustrated and hurt with my experiences at the school. I was sick of getting side-eye in the hallway. I did not enjoy being asked for the black perspective in class. And I was a little upset that I couldn't take any history courses that included the African diaspora. It was after learning that the Board of Trustees didn't have any inclusivity-related plans that a mentor of mine suggested I write the letter to generate conversation on campus. When I wrote that letter, I wanted the campus community to feel triggered and frustrated, just like I was. I intentionally picked language that would stir up emotions, and I didn't want anyone to be able to escape those uncomfortable feelings. So I took that letter and I sent it to every student, staff, and faculty email address on campus. I posted it on every single door, and I even slid some under the doors of the administration offices. The next day, everyone woke up to this two-page, single-spaced rant signed by yours truly. Obviously, it didn't take very long for the aftershocks to hit. One student just replied to my email, LOL. A history professor responded that since I had never taken one of their courses, and they checked, that I couldn't comment on curriculum. The school counselor chastised me for titling my letter a final farewell, because to them, it implied that I was going to end my life. Maybe worst of all, little to no change came. Many campus constituents reached out asking me to defend or expand upon my letter, but when I agreed to meet with them, very few followed through. And it took an additional four years before that campus funded and staffed a diversity center. I know that my feelings were completely valid, and I still agree with my decision to take action. But if I could do it all again, I would change how I took action. I wish somebody would have told me what I'm about to tell you. The language that you use while seeking change matters. After leaving that college, I went on to graduate school and earned a degree in integrated marketing communications. I started as a digital media assistant, transitioned to a director of marketing, and then came to the University of Wisconsin Green Bay to assist the admissions office with marketing and recruitment. So now, I literally get paid to choose the language that will best convince someone to take action. World works in funny ways, doesn't it? But I got to thinking, what would happen if we took those marketing and communications tactics and applied them to the social justice realm? It could be momentous. I want you to think of these next 10 or so minutes as your crash course in social justice marketing and communications. Every good marketing campaign begins with the audience. Who's your audience? You might already know them personally, but you'll have to dig deeper and think more critically. What value systems do they subscribe to? What ideas appeal to them? What viewpoints do they already hold on your topic, and why do they hold them? Doing this research about your audience will lay the foundation for the rest of your marketing campaign. And as you're learning more about your audience, you'll want to think about what common language you share with them surrounding your topic, if any. I often find myself writing communications geared towards first-generation college students who might not know what the bursar's office is or what a provost does. So it's my job to alter my message to keep us all on the same page. Similarly, when you're talking to your audience, you want to make sure you have the same definitions of key terminology. And if not, an educational component might need to be part of your plan. To me, there are six terms that span across all social justice initiatives. 
that you and your audience need to have the same definitions for. Ism, ist, reform, abolition, equality, and equity. It's critical that your audience understands that ism endings are used to describe a system or an ideology, like racism, sexism, even environmentalism. In turn, they should also understand that ist, I-S-T endings, are used to describe people who intentionally choose to operate within those systems. Be careful when you use these words because some of them may harbor feelings of pride if the connotation is positive, and others may cause defensiveness. This is the first mistake I made. I tossed these words in without much rhyme or reason, and then somehow was confused when they didn't have the impact that I expected them to have. The language that you use while seeking change matters. Another place that miscommunication can occur is when talking about reform and abolition. Reform, as many of us know, is making amendments or changes to a system with the intention of bettering it. When reform fails, however, people may begin to call for abolition or the total removal of that system. Now, where things can get tense and emotions can start to well up is when people let their imagination run on what abolition looks like in our society. Like when we talk about abolishing police, people's first thought is that it's a lawless world with violence and crime and no sort of governance. And that couldn't be further the, from the truth. What people are looking for when they talk about abolishing police is removing the faulty and flawed system that couldn't be reformed and replacing it with one that's equitable and beneficial to everybody. If you and your audience can't come to terms on the definition of these two words, your communications will fail. Take the time to build this common ground. The last set of definitions that everyone has to be on the same page about is the difference between equality and equity. Now, equality is exactly what it sounds like, a level playing field, the same for everybody. In a classroom, this might look like all of the students being given the same resources, learning the same materials, and then being expected to hit the same academic benchmarks. Equity, on the other hand, would be looking at the individual or a group of like individuals and looking at their specific needs and then providing the resources that meet them. So in that same classroom, one student might get tutoring after school. Another might need extra time on tests. There are countless individualized education plans that allow every single student in that class to get the support that they need to reach those same thresholds. If equality is the goal and the finish line, equity is the means to get there. So once you and your audience have these six terms and the same definitions, they will be the launching pad for the rest of your communications. Now you actually get to start writing. Unless you're part of a really bold and sometimes risky marketing team, snarky commentary won't get you anywhere. I learned that one the hard way. My letter was filled with jabs and non-constructive criticisms that ultimately made the important parts of my message fall on deaf ears. A word of advice, don't do that. Look for the places that your audience might take offense or might have a struggle with your language and think about altering it without changing your message. A good place to think about doing this is with privilege. People hate that word in the social justice realm. It has these knee-jerk reactions because people equate privilege to a lack of hardship or something reserved for majority populations in society, and neither are true. But even if privilege is the right word for your communication, if you know you're going to get that pushback, you might want to change it out for a word like immunity. It's a softer way of getting at those disparities in society without turning off the ears of your audience. The language that you use while seeking change matters. 
As you continue to hone in on your messaging, you'll want to think back to when you did that research about your audience and why they hold the viewpoints that they hold. You'll want to think about what concerns come out of those viewpoints, and you'll want to think of your proof points or supporting evidence to answer those questions. If your audience is worried about the cost of social change, dig into financial data. If they're worried about proposed solutions not working, look at case studies where it's already been tried. If your audience can't seem to see that a problem even exists, primary resources, maybe even your own examples, might be enough to open their eyes to the disparities. When I was crafting my letter, I thought that financial data was the right proof points for the situation. I was talking to a post-secondary education institution, which inherently always has to look at their bottom line. So I dug into data. I looked at private colleges with similar enrollments, endowments, number of minority students, and retention rates of those students. I then looked at whether or not those colleges had dedicated spaces and resources for those minority students or not. When I crunched all of this data, I saw that the colleges with those spaces not only retained the students at higher and higher percentages each year, but they also enrolled more of them. On the flip side of the coin, the places that didn't have those spaces lost more and more of those students each year and enrolled fewer and fewer of them. So when I looked at my college's data, we were gonna fall into that second category. So I took it a step further. I went back to those endowment and enrollment numbers. I looked at our tuition prices and how much tuition would be lost each year that those minority students continued to leave. And I calculated that it would only take about seven years or so before the college would need to close its doors. Now, I thought that all of this data that I had brought to the table was enough to convince my audience that there was an issue. But the campus community quickly told me that they couldn't see an issue even existed. Since my proof points didn't match their concerns, or lack of concern in this case, my message wasn't effective. So to this point, you've learned about your audience, you've established common language, you've crafted your message, and now it's time to choose your channel. And it's really about meeting your audience where they are. If you know your audience personally and you can have a face-to-face -face conversation, take that route. If you know them personally but they're not easily accessible, there's no excuse. We have so much technology at our hands. Cell phones, social media, Skype, Zoom, pick. If you're a boots on the ground type of person or you wanna reach a really large audience, peaceful, public protests have been known to turn the tide a time or two throughout history. The list goes on. A TV interview to reach a region, a podcast to reach a niche audience, maybe even a TEDx stage. When I wrote my letter, I directed it specifically to the college president, not the campus as a whole. I just wanted to bring them along for the ride. But in doing so, I created a very pointed attack that obviously caused backlash. I wish that I would have taken my grievances directly to a change maker, like that college president or dean of students, not only to ensure that I was heard, but also so that I could sit down and have a real one-on-one -on -one conversation and think about proposed solutions to these issues. So the final thing that you want to do when wrapping up your marketing campaign is leave your audience with a call to action. Welcome open discourse and encourage them to ask questions. Inspire them to learn more on their own. Challenge them to step outside of their comfort zone and join in on the fight. Because after all, if we can't get people to engage with us, we'll never move these social justice initiatives forward. And with that, we are at the end of your crash course in social justice marketing and communications. I am so ready to see how you choose to speak the language of social justice. The change that you seek, 
starts with you. And remember, the language that you use while seeking that change matters. Thank you.